very good. good evening. Uh, thank you very much uh, to Seth and, and to uh, our IDPCs, uh, the certified uh, directors from the program for organizing this. And of course, uh, this is a great opportunity to be in Greece. I will say also that uh, Greece has been very meaningful for us uh, because also with the IDPCs, with the students, with Cleopatra, uh, we actually also did some counseling for some Greek banks with Peter Nathaniel, who's here. And actually, uh, we decided to have a specific governance program for bankers because we felt, especially European bankers, because the issues were quite different. Uh, and, and banking is, uh, for me, a very um, uh, special industry. Uh, because it's so virtual and it's so built on trust and uh, you know if you if you're making cars or so and uh, Volkswagen goes down which it hasn't but if Volkswagen goes down you know you buy a BMW or another one it's not such a big thing but if a bank goes down then the whole uh, system collapses and um, I think that sort of distinguishes banking because the product is so virtual so in that sense it's so digital uh, it's so different and and I think that is then related to the governance uh, equation, which is how can we trust uh, the organization and how can we trust uh, the bank. Uh, so uh, Greece has been uh, meaningful to us and as, as, as you have uh, issues and challenges, of course, this is the opportunity and, and uh, I think this is the opportunity we've had and we've had several of, of our colleagues here um, who attended the program and thanks to this we'll actually have a uh, and not just a governance program for, for Greek bankers, but actually we'll have a, a, a governance program for bankers, for European bankers, which has benefited, uh, which will benefit from the support of the European Banking Federation. So Greece is shaping, you know, and leading Europe. So this was very, uh, very good. Um, we also felt as INSEAD that uh, we needed to do something about Greece, that, you know, we hated the, the Greece uh, batch, uh, bashing, uh, and this is the labeling, you know, and of course I come from uh, Belgium where there's always labeling, you know, I'm a bilingual Flemish guy and the Flemish keep uh, bashing the Walloons and the Walloons keep bashing uh, the Flemish and as they bash, you know, the country disappears in oblivion and Brussels becomes the most toxic word uh, in Belgium and not just in Europe. So um, bashing is not nice and labeling is not nice and it's sort of a cynical reaction when you can't do too much so thank you very much in that sense uh, for the the opportunity now i'm a little bit at a quandary because um actually a lot has been said uh, and i will just repeat a little bit uh some of the things that i found important in what was said and then maybe we can go uh, more quickly to the to the the q a and the first thing is uh, from uh, mr uh, fesas is i think values are paramount so if there is one criteria, uh, I think I will say there are four, but the most important criteria is you know, to have uh, good people. Good people meaning people with integrity. Uh, I'm on a board uh, where uh, we're not so clear on one. And uh, of course, one rotten apple uh, destroys the whole process and the whole dynamic. Um, and, uh, and then you have shareholder issues is that if that person also is a shareholder you know it's actually quite difficult to uh, get rid of the person uh, because you would like him to go to church and and ask for forgiveness but he's not there yet so he needs a coach uh, so values I cannot emphasize I think values enough and I think there should be a value check I would say and the most important that the uh, that the supervisors can do is actually not look at you know the CVs, uh, but actually you know the values of the people. Which is, if there is uh, an issue with a person, I would say change the director, and that would be the issue. Which is, uh, I even feel, and this is I think one of the issues: if you have a choice between a great CEO and a great director, uh, you know, then you choose for the CEO because it's much harder to find uh, a great CEO. Uh, than to find a good director and a director is a, a team player whereas the CEO is a game of one and I think certainly um, one of the things I've learned over time um, and that's sort of been good being a management teacher is the leverage of the CEO the leverage of the general manager I mean it makes such a difference to have a great general manager 
uh, and it, it creates so much hassle when you have uh, an average or actually a, a bad general manager. So a board shouldn't do anything that takes energies away from the general manager and of course from the management in general. Uh, but I think sort of having a healthy relationship between the general managers and understanding that the board is there for the organization, but that actually means for the general manager is paramount. When you start having ego games, uh, it is very destructive because now, you know, you have an ego between uh, the CEO and, and, uh, and one of the directors who might have been the former CEO. Uh, I, at that point, you sort of, somebody should step in and say, you know, we don't want to have that kind of a ping pong. It's very, very toxic. And actually, you hear it in the, in the comments. So it's not too hard to, uh, to stop. But I would say values is probably what is the most important. Uh, and I would say among values, I would say generosity as well, which is you're not there for you, you're there for others. You know, and that I think, uh, so you can call it altruism or uh, it's not just altruism. People must have fun and meaning, but I think you must have a degree of generosity and not saying, well, I'm going to work another hour. Therefore, you know, you need to pay me another hour. And in, in that sense, money should be, I think, um, uh, Plutarco said it very well, money should be off the table. You know, for a year, this is the rule. We pay you for so many days, and then we, we might rediscuss money at the end of the year, but we're not going to go into a taxi meter discussion, which is I didn't have time to prepare because I'm only, only paid one day of preparation, you know, per uh, meeting, and therefore I can't prepare. So I would say values is paramount. I would say people talk about competence, and I think this is absolutely true, and I think that's what we try to do, which is governance competence. Uh, not necessarily business competence. I would say you need business talent and governance competence. So I think business talent first, in the sense of understanding business. But talent is, you know, is is something different. You know, you have it or you don't have it. At INSEAD, we don't teach talent. You know, which is we take talented people, and then we hope we don't destroy the talent. Uh, but we give them. We we. Uh, we, I was at Harvard, and sort of the, you know, the dean of the of, of the business school, you know, said uh, our great virtue is we select good people and we don't destroy them. You know, that was the uh, we don't reduce the value. So uh, that's actually a goat, uh, not such a bad statement for boards. If the board is not value destroying, that's already not bad. Okay, so have low expectations for boards because it's a very complicated. Uh, issue and it's a long issue, right? I thought uh, from uh, Mr. Petropoulos, it was, I think what it was great is this Kaizen feature. We're building governance one a part at a time, and I think fundamentally, it took us 18 years. But that is because the owners didn't change. Because if you have new owners, you tend to have a new governance system, and then you have to restart. You know. And then mine is better than the old one, you know, and, and you're not sort of building Kaizen, Kaizen in terms of continuous improvement. So I think uh, this was wonderful to hear. Uh, this is there is no best practice in governance. Okay, that's very important. So, you know, be, be very careful and say, you know, when the investors are, or say, you know, uh, you should apply best practice. And the answer is uh, there isn't. You know, best practice in Japan, you bring it to Belgium, it's bad practice, you know. Japanese don't talk for 10 hours, and then they, after 10 hours, you know, and a bit of sake, they talk forever. You know, this is, uh, works in Japan, but it doesn't necessarily work in, uh, in, um, in Belgium. In Belgium, we drink all the time, so it's not <laughs> uh, we don't really work. We don't wait 10 hours to drink. You know. <laughs> so so um, I think I would say business talent, and when I say talent, is insight. You want... Um, uh, uh, board members, you know, who bring intelligence. In that sense, I, I really think teaching and board work are very similar because it's very intellectual. You know, do you have an insight? Uh, do you bring something to the board? And what you bring is a different look at the board. And of course, you need to be able to explain it a little bit because some people are very insightful but very intuitive. You know, and then they say, it's obvious the CEO is wrong, you know, and they say, well, could you tell me? No, it's obvious, <laughs> you know, and, and say, why? Well, I've known it for the last year, but nobody believes me. Well, part of the issue is maybe you could start explaining it a little bit, you know. 
Um, so I would say uh, talent is, is important. There is no governance document that refers to talent. It's all about competences. You know? Now you do need governance competences, but talent gives the edge, you know, gives the difference. And, and talent is basically you see things that other people don't see. You see problems, you see solutions, you see opportunities. I think uh, talent is the is the um, the, uh, the sort of, it's only the second one. And then I think you need to learn governance competence. And the key rule in governance competence is governance is not execution. And I think you should understand the difference. And I actually think there is no clear line. But every board should have a line where people start saying. You know, you're now stepping into execution, which is you're taking over from the executives. And this is, I think, where it's very useful that the board members themselves sort of say, hey, like, you know, uh, we're now doing executives' work. So if, if, if we're doing their work, then I think this is dangerous because the more we do their work, the less they will do their work and the less they'll improve, you know. And, and, um, and so we, we're crossing the line. So there should be a line. And I think the best example of... of um, a governance is Warren Buffett. I think it was when Solomon Brothers was in trouble. Uh, he had put so much money into Solomon Brothers that they asked him to be a chairman. He did it for five years. The Solomon Brothers was excluded from the auctions of the U.S. Treasury, which was a, their main business. And Warren Buffett uh, came to the Senate. And, um, of course, all of the other uh, competitors were very pleased that Solomon Brothers was in trouble. And because they were actually, they had cornered the market. They basically had taken too many uh, of, the, of the U.S. Treasury uh, bonds. And Warren Buffett said, uh, sir, you know, I will make sure that every executive, when he gets close to the line, not just over the line, when he gets close to the line, he'll be fired. So that was sort of the other side of the line, which is I don't want people to sort of start making tricks. And on that basis, actually, um, Solomon Brothers, uh, you know, could continue this business. You know, eventually it was sort of bought over as well. Uh, but the nice thing is uh, that, or the, uh, the nice thing is a great example of there should be a line. So when are you crossing? And in crisis, this is the difficulty. In crisis, of course, the line changes. Because if you have a crisis, it's because the executives typically are not necessarily doing what they do, or the board doesn't do what they do. So actually, you know, we need to cross the line to go to the other side. So in crisis, it's a bit different. Uh, but then you should know that you are, um, you are uh, crossing the line. And uh, well, because when you know you're crossing the line, you know, then you'll go back to the other side. So that is pretty, for me, governance uh, competence. And then finally, commitment, of course. It should be fun. Uh, you should say, you know, I'm willing to prepare. I'm willing. It's fun to go to board meetings. Uh, I like the, the board members. And I think you need to like the executives as well. Uh, that's very important. So that is the, the people side of the equation. That is the people side of the equation. Um, <coughs> I think probably the most important is, uh, and this was said very well by Mr. Petropoulos again, is the choice of KPIs, the measurement, uh, which is most people say we're performing and we're going to measure performance. Actually, it's the other way around, which is the choice of measure will determine performance. So if you, if you say, for example, like um, Wells Fargo, what's important is to open accounts for customers. Then you're going to get lots of people opening accounts. You know, it, it's important to cross-sell. Wells Fargo said, well, you come in here for a loan. We want you to sell something else. So the, the whole idea was cross-selling. It's not clear as a customer that I want to be subjected to cross-selling. You know, I know what I want. I'm not sure I, they need to buy me other stuff. So... In, in Wells Fargo, the whole idea was cross-selling. And now the rewards were, how many new accounts did you open for your clients? Well, the managers opened lots of accounts. You know, that's why actually Wells Fargo was, I think, fined a couple of billion dollars and could not grow until they, ha they have their house together. The governance question, of course, is where were the directors? You know, where were the directors? You know, did, why did nobody blow the whistle? 
why did the directors not open accounts? And, and I think in that sense, there is this practice, secret shopping, right? Secret shopping is I go into the shop and I just want to have the customer experience. I think that's a very useful thing, but you don't say, I'm the director, can I visit the factory or can I visit, you know, you go a little bit of secret shopping. This is, of course, non-transparent because you're cheating a little bit. You don't say who you are. But actually, if you do it with the right spirit to understand the customer experience, I think it's okay. So even transparency is an interesting word, you know, uh, which is if, if you, uh, for example, um, <clears throat> should you say everything? And the answer is, heavens no. You know? So... <laughs> So the question is, well, well, then you're cheating. Well, sometimes, you know, you have to keep things secret, but the, the, what's important is the spirit, which is, if somebody asks me to explain why I didn't say it, I will have a good explanation. I may be wrong, but at least I did it with the right spirit. And I think that is why governance is so difficult, because governance is spirit. And the form should support the spirit. Right? As a Catholic boy, I had to go to confession every week. That was formal. It didn't quite make me a better Catholic. You know? uh, the real question is, you know, sort of the more you confess, you know, the more you're said you're guilty, you're a bad guy, you know, etc. And, and the more they tell you you have to pray ten times, you know, etc. It doesn't necessarily, it could. If you're Opus Dei, you have to flagellate yourself, and that will make you a better Catholic. It could, but for me, it didn't work. So this is very important. Uh, this, of course, is where it goes wrong with regulators. Because regulators think that we're going to formalize, and that's going to improve the governance. Well, actually, it can go the other way. Okay? So what's important is not the regulation, but the spirit behind the regulation. And so in that sense, don't blindly accept the regulation, but go back and sort of saying, you know, what are you trying to do? Your regulation should be improved. And I think uh, we're probably all going to agree <laughs> that we need to have a bitching day a month about the European regulators. <laughs> Just to help them understand. You know, that would help a lot. I think that would be a fair play. And I think that's a very, very, uh, very important. Um, so, I think this is where I, I answer to the notion of how do you build a good governance system, and I would say one step at a time, and that is what I liked so much in Mr. Petropoulos' uh, example, is it's a journey. And the journey never ends. It's never over. You know, you can always improve. Because if I can, if I can uh, run the 100 meters in uh, 10 seconds and, um, and let's say, two, you know, two, two tenths of a second, I need to do a lot of work to go 10 seconds and one tenth of a second. So as you're getting better, it actually takes more effort. But it will give you better performance and more sustainability. But it will require more effort. You know, at some point... Uh, you know, you have to, to, to uh, balance things out. I think the world is changing. So, you know, people, when they optimize, they optimize for the past world, but not necessarily for the, the new world. So in that sense, I would say, forget optimization. All my career in was applied mathematics was optimization. You know, and I was an applied mathematician, and we always said, why don't they use our algorithms? And the real answer is because it makes people obsolete and optimization is not important. Governance is first avoiding the bad mistakes and trying to catch more fruit or catch more fish. It's not about optimization because optimization is static. It's best practice. That is not the spirit of governance. It's actually about, about uh, improving. Um, I think uh, I very much like what Plutarco said, which is, uh, the value to young firms. Uh, I, I, you know, my entry into governance, I had uh, t several entries into governance. The first is, of course, my family firm in Belgium, which I now realize uh, failed, disappeared because of bad governance. I said it's because of my uncle. But actually, my uncle probably did um, what he could 
but there was no supervisor. He was known as the Lion of Flanders. So we, when he came, he was the son of the founder, and then, you know, people would say, do you hear him? He's coming, because he was already yelling at the door for the receptionist not doing what they did. You know? And so when he came, people were ducking. He had the big luck that uh, his father, uh, my grandfather, um, actually created, wanted to keep harmony in the family, so he gave 52% to his son and 24% each to his two sisters. That did not create harmony. Okay? But that, of course, influenced the governance system. Now, if you had non-executive directors, they could start helping. So the best thing they could have done is each one appoints a non-executive director, maybe you know, uh, their representative, their nominee, and then these three people see what's good about Ludo, not me, you know, but big Ludo, which is my uncle. So um, the smaller you are, the more you need a board because you're alone. And through the board, you'll actually get credibility and you'll get insight. Now, this is where small startups are very different than big startups. Because in small startups, you use the board to get access to managerial insight. So I was part of an MBA, and he said, Ludo, do you want to be on the advisory board? I said, Bart, on the advisory board, nobody knows your firm. If this was IBM or Nokia or Piraeus Bank, you know, I would say yes. But, you know, South Wing is not a, a, a household property. He said, not yet. I said, okay, fine. Um, but I said, you should have a board. I'm too small to have a board. No, it's because you're small, you need to have a board. Like Liverpool, you never walk alone anymore, you know? <laughs> Very important. And he got, he was in, in, in Spain. He got the CEO of Orange. He got a Nokia CFO. He got me as a professor. I was the first chair. And he got a real board, which basically meant he could go to the bank. He got more credit. And when the investors came, the investor said, we need this and this and this. He said, no, 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 no. My board doesn't think so. We need five seats. What do you mean? There is a statue. There are no five seats. You know, there are only five board members. And they're already taken. So, so in that sense, you're not too small. What is actually amazing is the smaller the company, the more complex is board work. And because, you know, it's, it's, it, you, you have no report. By the way, you don't even have meetings. CEO is out because the client asks, you know, so you barely have meetings. So actually, uh, this is the, the, the story is that even small companies uh, need a, a board. And in that sense, uh, there is actually more value added to a young firm or a startup firm because there's nothing else. If you are in a big firm, there is there the executives, there are the reports. So the, the, the value add is going to be more difficult. Now, let me talk a little bit with Enigmas about Enigmas. It's the UK. There's, everybody agrees, you know, the UK are the, the best country in Europe to talk about governance. It's very insightful. Uh, they have a governance practice because they're imperial, right? So they didn't do anything, anything. They just told, you know, where shall we invest and who shall work? And the answer is the Indians, you know, not us. Um, and then uh, we need to man the boats. Yeah, that's where the prisoners will go. You know? uh, so the English um, have a great governance tradition. It fits their culture. Now, very interesting is uh, I studied at the, the UK industry, the automobile industry, which Mr. Petropoulos knows. And what did I discover? 100% ownership. And UK has never produced more cars than today. Now you say, mm, what's happening? And by the way, it's Japanese owners, French owners, German owners, but it's 100% ownership. So this is interesting, which is the UK industry, autom automobile industry, has never been more productive than today, thanks to the foreign owners. Because the first owners, BMW, they tried to, the Germans tried to manage the English. And they managed Rover. Now we know what happened with Rover, it disappeared. Because the Germans were managing too hard, the German way. And then, you know, the, the Germans said, these English people are unmanageable. You know, and the answer is, yes. That's why you shouldn't try to manage them. Go to the board. So the Germans retreated to the board. And actually, this is true with Tata Steel. Or Tata bought Jaguar, 
And everybody knows Jaguar is not run by the Indians. It's actually run by the English. But it's overseen by the Indians. And this goes on and on. Bentley is overseen by the Germans. But it's run by the English. So it's interesting that the UK governance system is perfect as long as you have foreign owners. <laughs> Hypothesis for research. <laughs> I'm trying to, to get, uh, to get um, uh, research on this. The German system is called co-determination. There are no independent directors. There are only shareholder nominees and labor nominees. Now, everybody says this is heresy. Now, either governance doesn't matter, which is Germans are just more productive than the others, but Germany is the most productive economy. Of course, part of the reason, too, is you know the euro helps them, and it makes the others a little bit harder. But Germany is the, the biggest. So the strangest system of co-determination, which is half of them are labor representatives, are actually an, a, a system that only dates out of history. It's actually due to Hitler, and there was a fight between the communists, the workers, and the capitalists who had been with Hitler too much. And the, there was the famous German compromise, which is 50-50. And the tying vote is the capitalist representative. So the German system is not regarded as better practice, and yet the performance of German companies is actually very, very good. By the way, what's behind it? A lot of Mittelstand, a lot of um, owners, and I think I will, I will probably finish with the, with, the, uh, <coughs> with the ownership issue. So let me talk a little bit about the US. US is very smart. They say ownership is very complicated. So US boards don't do too much. They outsource the governance to the markets. And you just look at the share price. And of course, if the share price goes down, you know, you change the board. The whole idea of governance is that you have the board so the share price doesn't go down. <laughs> so it's in anticipation. So, of course, but then Goldman Sachs likes things to go down, you know. So there is a dual interest, which is I like a lot of variety. I don't like sustainability. So boards are going in the wrong directions. Okay. Now, what's very important, you, the big companies have boards. And this is, I think, what, what was shown by Mr. Petropoulos, which is the people who do most of the governance are the corporate executives, not the big board. But when you are corporate like your firm now, you have business units. So the people who run the businesses are the CEOs of the business units, or the general manager. But the corporate executives do not run anything. And there is a lot of value destruction that comes when the corporate executives think they run the business, because they tell the people what to do. And the motivation goes down. And the worst thing is they say, it's thanks to us. And the business managers say, no, it's thanks to us. And who decides in the end? The corporate executives, you know. So that, that's sort of not so good. So there still are, are the best governance systems, unfortunately, I'm a Catholic, are Protestants. Uh, and this is actually, you can have your pick, Canadians, Scandinavians, uh, Australians. Uh, now the big question on the UK, it's actually a Catholic country because Anglican is a Catholic country. But of course you have a lot of Protestants too. So, so uh, US is sort of, uh, UK is a bit in the middle. The reason was because um, the, the church had a Medici who became a banker, who was from banking, Florentine banking, and he invented uh, new, uh, new uh, notes, and these were called forgiveness notes. So if you, were, uh, uh, if you were rich, you would buy forgiveness notes. So basically he said, you know, the church, religion, that's the best asset I can have. I can monetize guilt. And he did. Luther said, this is not religion. I want to talk to the chairman. And he said, "That's that. OK, you can talk to the chairman. You know, but he doesn't respond. It's the pope. Can I talk to the chief spiritual officer? Well, that's the pope, too. Can I talk to the chief strategy officer? That's the pope. Can I talk to the chief compliance officer? You know, that's the pope. And that is basically the conflict of interest, which is there are too many. This is why I think it is a good idea for the chair not to, to be the CEO. But there is no uh, real rule. Because I've seen boards where, uh, for example, the chair was the CEO, but the board meetings were run by the vice chair. 
And so the, so the, the issue, it's the spirit that matters. Do you have a spirit of check and balances? And as we know, we're Belgians, the Dutch protest all the time. So, you know, protesting is actually a good governance practice. But what matters is, do you do it for the improvement of the company? I think I should probably finish and I will now start my slides. <laughs> I think I will just say, I will just say that I had some beautiful slides which I worked on last night and this afternoon. And you can have them, you know, from uh, Cleopatra, Costas, or Christos. Uh, and I will just uh, uh, finish uh, maybe with, with uh, one slide. I think uh, this, I think, is very important. Uh, the duality of governance, which is do we have the right frame? And then do we have the right autonomy? So you give autonomy to the managers, and you as a board, you frame things. Some boards, you know, they like Alcatraz. Everybody's boxed in. And that, of course, is what's happening in banking now. The regulators are, are boxing people in, and that is disastrous. Now, you also have the financial crisis, which is there is no frame. It's complete rock and roll. Everything goes. That's absence of governance. Okay? Uh, but that's a good duality. Very important. Uh, balance of power. So the shareholders, the owner cannot fire the CEO. It's the board that fires the CEO. So the owner can, fi fight, can fire the board. You know, it's a terrible word in English. It's sufficient to finish your contract. You know, and the French are much more distinguished. They say, je vous remercie, I thank you, you know. <laughs> but the English put the CEO on fire. You know, why is this? Uh, uh, and this is the language is, is amazing. Uh, but basically, the owners are owners of dividends, of distribution rights, but they're not owning the firm. Sla there is no more slavery in business, right? So you own the dividend rights. You own the right to appoint the board or to fire the board, but it's the board that has fiduciary duty to the company. And that means that you, the stakeholder game is now, is now, even in the US, this is now accepted. And one way, for example, this is accepted, uh, I will not talk too much about this, uh, but yes, I will talk about, let me create an example. Um, here, you know this United Airlines? Uh, this became viral. United lost 10 billion of capitalization because this, the CEO, uh, you know, immediately went on and said, um, "This passenger was disruptive and belligerent." And now you can see him bleeding on the. And the people said, "Well, you know, he didn't seem so belligerent. He seems completely knocked out." And then the CEO said, "He deserves it." Well, the goodwill for that company was going down. By the way, every 10 years, uh, United Airlines has a problem with. Last 10 years, they broke somebody's guitar and he made the song. Um, the best thing, of course, this is a disaster, which is Volkswagen. This is owner-led destruction. Mr. P had a mission and he said, I will make Volkswagen as big as Toyota. That means we need to be number one in the US. Uh, we have the cleanest diesel. And uh, therefore, he said, you know, we'll conquer the USA. Now, the problem, of course, we now know is they didn't have the right technology to sell clean diesel because California is very tough. And of course, there is no problem a German engineer cannot solve. <laughs> so he did solve the problem. The problem is the administrators in the California trying to advertise clean diesel with Volkswagen said, it's not clean. There's something wrong with our equipment because it's dirty. So they changed the equipment, then they changed the car, and they were all dirty. They said, there's something wrong with Volkswagen. Worst reaction two years later, the CEO says, I did not know, you know, which is nobody told me. This is a bit surprising. Probably he's talking to a New York lawyer or something like that. Uh, just deny. Best, I think, is Uber. Uber CEO was dis disrupted. Um, and uh, the main reason was that uh, he had a video and that he was trapped on video. This was not, uh, this was tricky. Uh, he was tricked. And, uh, you know, the, the driver says, I'm, uh, his taxi driver, he says, I'm, I'm bankrupt because of you. And the CEO says, what do you mean? You know, some people just don't like to take responsibility for their own shit. Now, the problem is it was taped. So this became viral. And then the women said, yeah, it's not just the taxi drivers that are harassed. We women are harassed too. And then you have the beautiful statement of the CEO, who then has to resign. 
Now, Uber is the ultimate disruptor. So you would not expect the CEO of Uber to be disrupted by digital media. Um, and it was amazing. He said, there's one thing I learned, which is people matter. <laughs> Where was the board? You know? um, this, I think, we talked, which is actually uh, board's work is more on the negative side, on the downside, than on the positive side. Uh, I think it's more avoiding too much risk. It's actually, in Belgium, we always say, you know, in a board meeting, the CEO is not that bad, could get worse. No, no, if the CEO is not that bad, it's time to change because there's no downside of with the change. So you need to be very demanding uh, with the CEO. And I think in that sense, if, you know, the board is there to pump you up and, and to, you know, get you to the higher level, but not necessarily to do your work. I would say uh, minimizing the downside and minimizing the time of the downside. If, if a company goes too bad for too long, it's typically because of the board or the owners that are tolerant. And of course, one of the problems of Greek banks is the central bank has become an owner. And this is important. You cannot look at governance without looking at the owners. It's the owners who set, who set the tone. Um, I will finish uh, up. I think this is the most important last slide, I promise. Uh, oh, yes, this is actually an interesting slide, which is it was Obama who solved the BP crisis. You may remember Tony Hayward. He was blaming everybody, including Transocean. And then Obama uh, invited the CEO of uh, the chairman of uh, BP and said, tell your CEO to shut up and take responsibility. Uh, and basically, if you give me 20 billion, I will help you. And uh, Ericsson said, I didn't know I was coming to a mafia meeting, you know. And he said, no, 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 no. Uh, you have to come leave my office, have a press conference, and announce that BP is pledging 20 billion to clean up Louisiana and to save the birds, etc., etc. And you have a, 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 a compensation fund or a restoration fund. And it took three hours for the chairman to talk to the CFO. And at the end, the chairman came out and said, I'm very proud to announce that I came to the US to announce President Obama that I was pledging 20 billion. <laughs> this is not quite the way it happened. Uh, so, you know, uh, it's important to have good friends. <laughs> uh, let me finish. Uh, I think this is the last picture. This is the, uh, the, the owners board of directors and the executives. I would say governance is a system and every executive has go governance responsibility and every owner has governance responsibility. So it's not just the board of directors, it's the story of the three boards. And value creation means the three boards are aligned on the same thing, which is we know, we know what are the KPIs and the board is very much looking long term, the owner's looking long term, the board medium term, the executive short term, but we're all aligned on the same mission. And that is the story of three boards. As a corollary, you can't have good governance if the owners do not insist on it. So, and the most important is on, in governance is who do you appoint to the board? Do they have the right values? Do they have integrity? Do they have business talent? Can they work together? Are they collaborative? And are, do, are they doing it for the right reason? So for the rest, I will leave my slides with, with uh, Costas and the organizers. So if you want to see a copy of the slides, you can do so. But I will stop here. Thank you.